Welcome to the Configure It Done podcast. The Configure It Done podcast is a place where successful thought leaders in the SAP space come to share their leadership styles, their tips, and their unique stories on how to run successful large-scale SAP programs. Listen to the podcast to learn from their successes, their failures, their career stories, and their inspirations. This podcast is in partnership with the Black Dog Institute, who aim to create a mentally healthier world for everyone. If you wish to support the cause, please donate via the link below. Welcome, Scott. Configure It Done podcast. We're on season five, episode two. Wow. Which is unbelievable, really. We season think, five. Cranky. Yeah, yeah, last couple of years we've, um, we've done quite a few of these, but yeah, excited to have you on uh, today. Excellent. Glad to be here. And uh, Abby, you're back on for your fourth? fourth this is my fourth and my second face-to-face. So I've never had quite the bright light in front of me before, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's probably <laughs> gleaming off my head at you. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> really is. lovely. I'll put some sun cream here, <laughs> shall I? <laughs> well, I know you watched Alex one before. That was happening as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no problem. All right, Scott, well, um, let's dive in. What we normally do, and what we normally do at the start of the, uh, the podcast is a quick-fire question round which is no more than three minutes, and Abby's going to fire loads of quick questions at you so the audience gets to know, know you. All right? Awesome. I love it. You ready? Yeah. Let's go. What's your full name? Scott Charles Davidson. Scott Charles Davidson. And what is your nickname? Um, either Davo or Scotty. Okay. Original. <laughs> Can we call you Scotty through the podcast? Yep. Or Davo. Or, Davo. or Charles, as the case may be. <laughs> <laughs> um, and where are you from, Scott Charles Davidson? Uh, I would say, I mean, when people ask me that, I'd say I'm Tasmanian. So I uh, nice. spent my, my life growing up in Tassie, but I was actually born out of circumstance in London. Um, but uh, at a very, very young age, moved to Tassie and grew up there. Ah, so have you got a British passport? I do. I have a, both a British and an Australian passport. Oh, you one of the best luckies. holidays in Tasmania, wasn't it? Yeah, sure was. <laughs> um, how long, I was going to say how long have you been in Australia, but since a baby by the sounds of it. Yep, but I, I, in my early 20s went over to the UK and lived there for 13 years. Yeah, and London and Sunderland, we've heard. Bit of Sunderland. Yeah. Um, mainly Cheshire, actually, is where oh. I lived. So, yeah, London and then Cheshire to raise a few kids. Yeah, very nice. That's part of it. Our... Isn't that where all the footballers live? There were a few of them around, yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, used to see Bobby Charlton in our supermarket all the time. That's cool. <laughs> That's really cool. Don't get that in Balgala, eh? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so where are you currently working, Scott? I work at EY. I'm a mm-hmm. partner in our people advisory services business. Awesome. Very exciting. Um, and what's the best job that you've ever had? Well, I have to say the one I've currently got. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that one. Oh, look, actually, I, I did when I was younger at university have a job at a bottle shop, and that was probably the most fun job that I ever had because I... Uh, there was uh, a lot of characters that were customers and there was a lot of characters that I worked with. So I yes. still look back and that was some of the funniest times of my life. In Tassie? Or? Yes, yeah, it was yeah. in Tassie in a pretty uh, um, working class, rough suburb of Hobart where um, uh, nobody pulled any punches and there was a, <laughs> a lot of good colourful language used. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, and so what's the worst job? Uh, worst job, I was a pizza delivery driver for a little while as well in, in an equally interesting suburb and uh, I didn't last too long with that job. Free pizza though? A couple. Yeah, <laughs> just doesn't make up for it. Um, Favourite sport? Uh, to play myself tennis to watch mm-hmm. AFL. AFL, okay. Um, Favourite beer? Uh, I'm very parochial for Tassie beer, so Cascade. Oh, lager. Cascade lager, there you go. Uh, Favourite meal to go with your beer? Uh, yeah, I'm pr- pretty straightforward with that. I think steak with pepper sauce and some chips, that's some probably chips me. Get, no salad, no veg? Um, yeah, a little bit of salad. I'll yeah, have just because you have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what's your favourite ho- hobbies? Uh, I'd say sailing, tennis. I play a bit of music um, in terms of 
instruments, play the guitar and the keyboard. That's cool. Um, and then, you know, I've got three young kids, so everything about them. Yeah, true. Saturday morning sports, right? There's been a lot of that. That's yeah. starting to wind down now, though. Yes, end of the season, isn't it? And But also they've lost interest as they get into their <laughs> later teenage years. Hey, right, okay. Yeah, I used to be into singing and acting, and then as soon as I became a teenager, that was long gone. So, yeah. Um, Favourite music or film? Uh, music's... I, I love, love loads of music. It's probably, you know... A, a lot of different forms of rock music, but you know the the sort of the, the Springsteens, the Bowies, and and also the the Pearl Jams, that sort of thing. And so is this why you play the guitar? Yeah, yeah. very much so. And then um, movies again, bit of a movie buff, so probably watched a lot. Um, my two favourite movies, whenever anyone asks, uh, Full Metal Jacket and L.A. Confidential. <laughs> Classics. <laughs> yes. Yeah, love that. Kind of giving away your age a little bit as well. There. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, your best holiday destination aside from Sunderland? Uh, best holiday destination, probably the Pahintian Islands in Malaysia. So mm, little, very specific. Sm- small little islands off the northeast coast. And uh, went there at a time when there wasn't much else and just beautiful water to swim yeah. and Gorgeous. go and dive in and what have you. So, yeah, that was lovely. Lovely, lovely. Um, apart from a pizza delivery driver and a bottle shop worker, what did you want to be when you were younger? I thought I was going to be a writer. I thought I was going to write mm. screen and plays and movies and TV shows and those sort of things with um, yeah. particularly comedy stuff. So I thought that for many years. Did you study that or...? Uh, until I left school and then when I was in London I did a bit on the side, but yeah. Yeah. I, I, I got into this way more interesting career called SA. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially way more lucrative though, but well, I don't know, if you'd have hit it off maybe. Um, so if you could, this is kind of a bit different, but if you could describe your management style in one word, what would it be? <sighs> Always tough, that one word. Um, you can use two or three. We'll, we'll let you off. Look, I, th- I think I'm pretty collaborative, and and the other word I'd use is empathy. So I've got to an age now where I think I'm pretty understanding of walking in everyone I'm engaging with shoes, mm-hmm. and so I try to probably use that in in my style of understanding what you know what it is that motivates them, what's what's their desires, fears, etc. So. Yeah. But also just making sure everyone's working together because, you know, that's in terms of the work we do, project-based work, it only ever works well if it's collaborative. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So while we're on, on that note of, uh, of work, we'd love to uh, dig deep into your background, Scott, and your, your career. But first of all, let's, tell it, or let's start about the start and your journey and your story into to SAP. Yeah, so look, I, I went to London doing what a lot of Australians do in their early 20s and, you know, that was really to just travel and and uh, have a bit of fun and then I sort of ran out of money and needed to work and I had a bit of accounting experience and I ended up at the BBC and um, and within a few weeks of being there, they, they asked me to be part of an SAP implementation. I had no idea what that was, <laughs> um, but I got on board and I realised I liked it a lot more than accounting. Mm-hmm. And uh, the writing, the writing career wasn't taking off the way I had assumed it was going to. <laughs> and so I thought, well, this will fill the time. So I got into SAP that way, helping on and originally the client side, and then in the mid '90s, that's when everything went gangbusters with SAP for the, probably the first time. And uh, so I started to get into consultancy around that time. Yeah, we hear a lot of people just fall into SAP rather than, you know, it's not something you go to uni to study and then you get into it. It's usually if you're in an organisation, they start implementing it. So it's good to hear that you did that too. Yeah, very much so. And and I did it at a time where, you know, the joke was at the time you, you only had to be able to spell SAP to get into <laughs> SAP. But, uh, it's kind of similar to it at the moment, isn't it, with the talent shortage? Well, yes, <laughs> like, I think it is. It's, it constantly amazes me that I'm still doing it, but also that it still has the demand that it does. So, um, But, you know, it's been good. It's taken me to loads of interesting places, including Sunderland, as we discussed. <laughs> but, it, uh, and you know, the, the project work and the variety of work that I've had over the last, you know, 
scarily when I say it, sort of 27 years yeah. is, is, you know, is remarkable and there's not too many jobs he could have done that would have, would have enabled that. So um, that's been you know, quite a remarkable journey in that space. I was just saying, it seems like it's going to continue. We met with someone recently, well, Jay met with someone recently, pretty senior within SAP, and she was just saying that it's going to go gangbusters again. So kind of like the 90s. I think the, I mean, the, the biggest issue facing the, the industry that we're in at the moment is and, and there is just a fundamental shortage, the likes of which I don't think has actually been seen since the early 90s. Mm. And the, the way I describe it to people is, you know, in the, in the mid-90s, there was, you know, it, it broke, ERP broke, it was kind of year 2K bug, which some of you people probably weren't even born. I remember. <laughs> but, uh, but there was a lot of compelling yeah. factors for people, to, for organisations to sort of move in the direction of SAP. And so mm. they... Uh, the big, big accounting firms, consulting firms like EY invested heavily in training up a huge number of graduates. Um, and so there's, there's a, that was one way of satisfying the demand. A lot of people came from industry. But then that, that waned and then there was a lot of movement towards offshore that happened through the early 2000s and through the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. And even that has then sort of waned a little bit. And so now with the, the, the need for a lot of organisations to actually move forward, there's actually a bigger shortage because a lot of those people who came in have left and gone elsewhere and done, done other things, but yeah. no one's actually been building up that talent pipeline to replace it. So yeah. massive issue to, to overcome. And we've been relying here in Australia with that overseas talent um, coming in. Um, yeah, it's just, and like with COVID, like you said, people have left and uh, we've, unfortunately, we've got an aging talent pool here and there's no, you know, new grads coming through and yeah, it's, it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I work in the people advisory, so very HR focused tech nowadays. Um, and and the biggest issue we pretty much see across the board in in the HR or employee space is you know talent. Everyone's preparing for how do we deal with talent shortage, talent at, um, attraction, and and also holding on to people because it's it's becoming a real thing so uh yeah. and that's not just in our sap consulting industry that's but go across the board across the board yeah what have you got in place to to try and you know deal with that well i think it's it's really interesting i mean ey we we're obviously a massive organization globally so there's i think nearly three hundred thousand people now and 70% of our workforce is actually under the age of 35. So wow. Wow. It's, a, it's, a, it's still a very young um, workforce predominantly. Is that and just in SAP or across? No, the, that's yeah. across, across absolutely the whole organisation. But, but as a result, you really have to take that seriously in terms of how do you attract but also hold on to people. Mm. And, and so, you know, it's an interesting one. A, a lot of our customers actually ask us, what are you doing? Because... They go, if, if EY's got an idea of how to deal with this at the biggest end of the town and at the big end of scale, then there's got to be some, um, you know, little nuggets of, of gold in there about what we might do. So huge amount in the terms of the younger generation in particular is around real focus on employee experience, employee well-being, um, really focused on the values that are coming through in that generation and making sure mm -hmm. that we're aligned with those mm -hmm. uh, because that, you know, en masse makes a huge difference to these 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 younger folk. And, and as we say, the, the opportunities they're getting because there is a talent shortage means you, you have to, there's no choice, you have to do this, otherwise they'll go elsewhere. Uh, true. What's your, if you was a, um, a customer or um, someone in a different organisation, they've got those same challenges as EY has around talent shortage. What would be your your number one tip around, um, especially that retention piece and trying to keep... Well, I'd say get EY into implement success <laughs> factors. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's going to make it the huge difference. But look, I think, I mean, you know, in, in real terms, uh, the organisations that we see doing this sort of thing well they're being very proactive about it. They are absolutely focused on um, employee experience and uh, they're evaluating how that impacts a huge a number of things in terms of the, the employment life of individuals, whether that's not just HR processes, but how they engage with the rest of the organisation, how they engage with um, their leadership and management. So massive um, transformation happening in a lot of really good organisations around how managers work. Um, mm -hmm. the, the pandemic's really exacerbated that 
a lot as well because suddenly a lot of people who, you know, like Simon here, never thought he'd let people work outside the office, so suddenly have to let them move to Brisbane and have slightly more flexible working hours, but they're seeing the benefits of it. But it's just, that is a massive impact in itself. So the ones who are doing, you know, the the really well, they're being very proactive and, and kind of innovative in that sort of way, mm -hmm. um, much like you guys are, I think, from what I can tell. Um, some of the ones who are holding on to the past, mm -hmm. they're the ones I'd be saying, you've got to do something about this because you, you don't have long. Mm. No, they certainly don't. And in um, in terms of this, this focus on the, the, the pandemic and your management style before versus, versus after, what's changed, yeah? Uh, look, I think... I think it proved that, you know, that what we probably knew all along is that if you've got the right people and you provide the right work and conditions for them, then they'll work no matter what. So it doesn't matter if you, they're sitting in an office or not. Interestingly enough, we find a lot of the younger folk in our um, team uh, want to be back in the office almost full time. Um, um, they're, they're the ones driving hard because they want the socialisations and the, the social aspects of being able to engage with people. And so we're facilitating um, that. Um, I think you know, working virtually, we've had to, I think everyone's had to explore what working on teams meant in terms of the various downfalls, but also benefits of doing all that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has made a huge difference to people's ability to collaborate, um, whether that's online or just in general, being under understanding of how to communicate with folks. So I think that that's been a real learning, certainly for me, is to to embrace that. And and and, um, and I think as well, uh, accepting that people have optimums that they want to work with, they're finding a new normal for what was actually working well for them, whether it's full-time back in the office, whether it's full-time out of the office or, or a mixture of, of both. I think being respectful and cognizant that's not going to be the same for everyone yeah. is probably pretty helpful in that space. Mm. So are you happy then to facilitate, say, Joe Bloggs wants to come in five days a week, but Mary Bloggs doesn't want to come in five, she doesn't want to go in at all. Are you happy to facilitate both of yeah, those? Yeah, look, yeah. Look, that, that is that is the position that we're taking at EY for sure, which is, you know... Choose your own destiny. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and also... You know, going as far as offering people chances to work away, even remotely, when I say remotely, even internationally, um, mm -hmm. but still be working on Australian customers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, really being open to very, very um, flexible suggestions that are coming from the employees themselves that we might never have thought of before, but yeah. demand and the nature of work is, is sort of, you know, generating that. And as I say, from a productivity perspective and results perspective, the pandemic you know, didn't didn't bring about those negative effects, but the the one that it did bring about was, you know, a lot of wellness issues for people, and particularly with mental health and those sort of things. So, mm -hmm. making sure that we're addressing all of those, and also trying to make people, you know, feel like they've got that flexibility in their work environment. So it's opened up a huge number of opportunities, I think, in that space. Yeah, yeah, that mental health wellbeing piece is is huge, and then that's where the uh, the four day week idea come from because. Um, it was actually Jill that um, our, our founder she suggested it, and it was she was like productivity is affected by well-being. And, you know, if people are happy and and you know within themselves, they're gonna um, you know the productivity is gonna go up because of that. You know, so it's a huge piece. Absolutely, I think. I mean, it's it's funny we <clears throat> we're talking about this before the pandemic came up, but that you know the, there's a lot of evidence out there about the. You know, the employee experience having a direct result or a direct link to a company's perform organizational business performance mm -hmm. and and the smart leaders out there get that intuitively and they want to put things in place and enable that to, to maximize and mm -hmm. to get the best out of that i think the COVID pandemic has actually just brought a lot of realization to a lot of people who hadn't quite realized that that that's they have to do that so yeah. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a key part of you know, what we're doing is going into organisations and helping them work out where can they add value to employees' experience that will actually then help sort of move the needle in the right direction from a business performance perspective as well. And the tables have turned, haven't they? The candidate's in the driving seat now rather than, you know, EY, for example. So Absolutely. Yeah. I think they, um, you know, there the, the was a massive transformational change in terms of, you know, being able to, you know, to do that. But in a way, that's a good thing because I think that, that actually 
you know, those organisations that do the right things and actually mm. embrace that and, 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 and see the value yeah. in, in doing that. Um, that's better for everyone. And, uh, and, you know, it's not a plug. EY's purpose really is built to build a better working world. And so we've got to stick true to that. So yeah, that's that's where that comes from. I was watching a show the other day and it was set in the 90, oh, early 2000s, I think. And it was set in an office, not the office, but it was set in an office. <laughs> Quite far um, yeah. <laughs> and I was just looking at the, the working culture. It was like a documentary kind of thing, just looking at the working culture then in comparison to now. And it just, just completely different. Everyone in sort of gray suits and yeah. wearing a tie for, you know, what to sit at a desk and type away. So yeah. Oh, yeah. I work in my slippers most days. So. I, remember, I remember doing an SAP implementation in Slovenia. Oh gosh, and, you've been uh, everywhere. And, and it was a, it was for a tobacco company. And the first meeting I had, I sat down. And I got handed a packet of cigarettes to sort of like it was oh. like it was some biscuits and tea. But yeah. like, yeah, light up and have a cigarette. I'm like, yeah, that wouldn't happen anymore. So. Oh no, would it? Would it? <laughs> it's a big, big, big difference. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to steer the, the conversation towards um, projects and how would you define a, a successful project? Oh, um, look, I, th I mean, a, a successful project has got to be one that delivers on the outcomes that were intended from it and, and hopefully within a, a certain, certain time frames and, and budgetary and, and cost constraints that it had as well. Um, but I think there's a little bit more of that, more than that uh, for me. The ones I look back on and think are successful were not only the ones that sort of went live on time and did what they were meant to, but the ones where, you know, people had a, a great time along the way and, it, you know, built a really successful team from it and those sort of things. So for me, there's a bit of ex special sauce there that, that makes a successful project. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot that don't go that successfully, but um, I certainly think the ones that do, um, you know, they obviously have to deliver business-wise, but they have to also deliver for the people who, who have been working on them as well. Yeah, yeah. I remember John Golfin on the um, podcast on the last series, and yeah, he was saying a, a successful project is, you know, if you go fast forward 20 years and those same people still remember that project and you might bump into them and talk about that, that particular project you worked um, on. Absolutely. That is, it's really uh, resonates a lot with me because, you know, some of the best friends I still have are from, you know, not from Sunderland, but uh, <laughs> but from, you know, for some of those projects I worked on, whether they were clients or whether they were colleagues of a consulting organisation, you're still friends with them now because, you, you, you know, you, you all got into the trenches, but you actually had a great time doing it. You know, that's uh, like anything. That's that that is that makes a big success of it. Sure, sure. Bringing it back to the people again, though, isn't it? Employees, it's the people that make the projects, right? Look, it, it absolutely does, and um, and uh, you know, again, I'm not. We, we're doing a lot of work on this, and, and it's because you know, very much we're we're finding out, and it's not rocket science, but it is. It is there is some scientific basis to it that success in this space and particularly when you're talking SAP you're typically talking about big transformational initiatives it's really the when when you look at the levers that determine failure or success most of them are to do with how you've treated various people and how you've looked at the almost managing the psychological experience of the people involved the people who are going to be impacted by it etc yeah. and so those levers are really important and uh, you know a lot of people are taking notice of that now because they're saying you know quite a lot of these things don't go so well but the the, the common elements are very much humans at the center and the you know lack mm -hmm. of actually paying enough attention to that interesting and focusing on uh, the people and specifically your teams Scott what, what do you look for within the team that could be when you're hiring somebody or someone that you know has been inherited or you've got in your team what, what do you look for what are the key characteristics yeah look it's a really interesting question because I mean you know there is a shortage so you don't get you don't get at all you know the, you know but but I, I think I mean there's a level of experience that has to be there you know it has to be someone who's who's walked the journey before mm. but I think the things that are differentiating for me are I try and pick people who've got a level of resilience because a lot of the projects we work on are not straightforward. You know, they're tough. Um, they they can be quite long, and and so people who who've kind of been who I can sense can actually handle that journey. I think is is pretty is pretty key. Um, the other one is, um, as I mentioned before, collaboration is absolutely key for me. Is that I need a sense that these people are going to not be off working in a corner by themselves, but are going to be absolutely a team player and really 
want to help. They'll they'll jump in where they have to um, to help others, and at the same time they'll they'll call out when they need help from others, and that will be a key part of how we work. So um, yeah, absolutely collaboration would probably be right up there, and a little bit of resilience as well. It's, it's pretty hard to find sometimes as well. I feel like precision sourcing could work well anyway, couldn't we? <laughs> Similar sort of values and ideals, and yeah. <laughs> well, I think you guys. Well, you guys. You know. You, in a lot of ways, similar. I mean, you you have you were having to engage with a lot of different people, and and I'm sure you see the difference, you know, when you do with it. So it's um, but and in, at the end of the day, we're both trying to make sure we find and manage talent the right way to get outcomes achieved for our customers. So it's... you should start doing the four day week thing next. <laughs> <laughs> I, <Big> I, <laughs> I like the idea of it. I've had quite a few holidays in the last six weeks. I just turned fifty, so I've had a bit of time off. So, mm, so uh, but four days a week does sound quite pleasant. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Who's been the biggest influence in your career, and what did they teach you? I, I think that there is about there's three or four leaders or bosses I had along the way mm-hmm. um, that made a massive difference, and in in all cases, I think they. You know, and, and something I learned from a leadership perspective is they saw something in me that others didn't, and and kind of alerted me to the fact that you know, oh, you know, you can do this, or yeah. and and put yourself out of your comfort zone, and then they gave me a level of trust and a, a level of responsibility that to sort of help me move forward, and so there's been a few that, and that's a common characteristic, and um, and at the same time they managed to do that, and remain, um, and 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 also sort of, I guess bring a certain level of intimacy into that work relationship. So they're the sort of people that I'm still friends with, yeah. keep in touch with now. So, you know, they some of them probably don't know that they've had that impact, which I probably should do something about. But, um, but yeah, there's a few that I would say along the way where you, you get given a little bit of, you know, throw on a bone that says, you know, you can do this, yeah. a little bit out of your comfort zone, and then you get trusted to do it. Um, that that is where I think I've made step changes career wise. You've got the platform here to just say thanks to them, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no. Well, they, they, half the time that is the the relationship does. When I say friends, you know, when I live over the other side of the world, it's uh, congratulating each other for a work anniversary or a promotion <laughs> on LinkedIn yeah. is yeah. about it. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a sneaky comment on a Facebook photo pa- pa- page or something. Well, one of the next questions actually, and we'll get to it, is who you would like to see on the podcast next. So if any of these people that you could see in your past if any of them are Australia or well, actually internationally based as well would, would work so but we'll get to that question no so worries. think about it um, <laughs> the next question is what would you tell your 21 year old self um, how's he Scott uh, look I think it'd probably buy Microsoft shares <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a good one no I, it's funny I actually last night I was at a promotions dinner celebrating all the people in our team who've been promoted yeah. and I actually was asking them that exact question what yeah. but I limited it to what three words so I did get you know buy bitcoin you know a few yeah. times but um one of them was fantastic and one of our ladies said she said just chill out and <laughs> and I think there's something in that I yeah. think that there's so much sort of worry and various mm. different things that you just got yourself worked up over the years and everything mm. if you work hard if you're nice to people things tend to work out the right way and That's um, true. and uh, so I, was, I I thought that was pretty good that's a good bit of advice yeah, yeah. We can call that the, uh, that can be the title for this podcast. Just, Just chill, out. chill out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wise words by Scott. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Natalie, who's the woman who said that, she'll go, you appropriated that from me. <laughs> yeah, I stole that. I'm really Just chill sorry. out then. <laughs> <laughs> Works on so many levels, you see. Um, so, yeah, who would you like to see on the podcast, Scott? Oh, I want to hear from Natalie, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Just chill out. <laughs> I, look, on an interest level, I think, I mean, I th- it's probably quite a good just to get insights into different people, but I'd, I'd be good if you haven't had them already. There's a lot of ex-SAP people have moved into sort of, you know, the hyperscalers like Amazon and, and Google. It'd be really good to hear from them and what they what they think about that move and what they think about the future and those sort of things. So Anyone I'm, in particular? I'm not going to, I won't name any specific individuals. Text but, me later. Yeah, okay. I can text yeah. you later. But I think, I think it'd be good to hear from them because it's a whole other industry that's spun out of, um, sure. um, mm. you know, the SAP ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. sure. I've got a few names in mind after that. So, okay, that's good. 
But no, brilliant. Thank you for your time today, Scott. Really, really enjoyed that. Thank you, guys. As always, great to see you.